Morning. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, while I scroll ahead about 70 slides that I should have been doing before, uh, let me ask, uh, are there any questions um, from the previous? Uh, don't, you'll get seasick. Anyway, uh, does, does anyone have any questions uh, from the previous lectures or if you uh, read the, the slides online or tried any of the problems? Um, where did we lay you off? Here we go. So, any questions? A good time for a problem session would be this afternoon at the Horrigan. So, um, nothing like doing math problems over a friendly glass of wine. So, um, feel free to talk to me then or after the lecture. Okay. All right. So, um, let's just recall where we left off. Um, we were discussing uh, gluing at the end of yesterday, um, both uh, in particular uh, discussing some details that are common to both the constant scalar curvature gluing problem and the CMC um, gluing construction of Eisenberg, Mateo, and Pollock. Um, and essentially we discussed with you know, a little bit of uh, detail and motivation how the process works, the, the idea of blowing up a neighborhood of a point uh, into an asymptotically cylindrical end, um, surgering two such cylindrical ends together, right, and then um, making an approximate solution and then having to solve to, to uh, deform that solution to an exact solution. So um, uh, either an exact solution of the vacuum constraint equations um, uh, or uh, an exact solution of constant scalar curvature, which is a solution of the vacuum equ constraint equations with um, cosmological constant. Um, that, as it says here, but there's too many words, it's too early in the morning, that if you remember, that the point was that um, when, you, when, when you've completed the gluing construction and you've solved the nonlinear equation, outside the gluing region, out here and out here, the data is close to what it was originally, but not exactly on the nose. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, uh, there are non-degeneracy conditions that have to be stated in those theorems to be able to make the construction work. Um, in the constant scalar curvature gluing problem, there's, there were conditions, there's a you know, eigenvalue condition um, in the IMP gluing, the constant mean curvature gluing for the constraints, um, I don't know if I, I don't think I emphasized this yesterday, but there is a non-degeneracy condition there as well, because um, if you remember, we discussed in the conformal method this operator divergence of LW yesterday. I don't want to, I don't need it today, so I'm not going to go through the details, but we needed that operator to help uh, move an approximate solution to an exact solution. And so, we actually have a in the in the IMP construction a non-degeneracy condition uh, on this operator, okay, to be able to make the construction work. Okay. Um, so, um, someone asked me a good question after the lecture, I mean, one of many good questions after the lecture, um, uh, and it occurred to me I, I could have mentioned something yesterday um, when I stated the constant scalar gur curvature gluing construction. I stated it for manifolds with boundary, and there's a little remark about, well, if you don't have a boundary, here's the situations you might be able to do this. Um, one situation you can't do it, and it, it wasn't listed there, it wasn't a mistake, I just, maybe I'll just point this out today, I think it's a good time after Mikhail's lecture, is that if you're doing constant scalar curvature gluing zero, all right, so zero constant scalar curvature, that wasn't, on closed manifolds, that wasn't one of the cases considered in, in the gluing construction. You take two, zero scalar curvature closed manifolds and try to glue them together and get a metric of zero scalar curvature. And the reason is, they're not just that the proof breaks down, it has to break down because it's not, you can't do that construction in general, okay? For example, uh, Mikhail was talking yesterday about, you know, there's no positive scalar curvature metric on a, on a torus. Eh? There's no um, such metric, uh, positive scalar curvature, zero scalar curvature metric on a connect sum of two tori. So, so if I gave you two flat tori and said, try to surgery them together, uh, constant scalar curvature, it can't go back to zero. Uh, so, um, 
So you have to watch your non-degeneracy conditions. And, and uh, you can always ask yourself, if, is, it a, is it just a part of the proof? And there's another way to prove the construction? Or is there an actual obstruction to the construction? So uh, a natural question I want to discuss today is, uh, can you come up with a gluing construction, carry it out, either in the constraints, or we'll focus on the constraints in the time symmetric case, just the scalar curvature constraint, um, with maybe a non-degeneracy condition, which preserves exact copies of regions in each initial data set. So could you do a gluing construction, taking two solutions or more, uh, glue them together in such a way, you solve the constraints, the vacuum constraints, and you leave the data exactly the same away from the neck. Exactly the same. You know, and still solve the nonlinear problem. That's the question. All right. Um, one note that I squeezed on the top of this slide, didn't fit on the other slide, is, is the following. In terms of the um, Einstein equations, if you're thinking about this as initial data, um, if you have two solutions to the Einstein equation, and you have regions in the solutions that you're interested in, right? Those regions, as we know, so you, see, you, see, you, you do have kind of a, you know, a, those regions can be used to evolve in, into a space time. So if you're able to put these together into a single, I'll call this one and two. If you're able to put those regions together into a single solution of the constraints, and the initial data agrees exactly with what you had to start, then when you evolve the data, at least for some time, you'll preserve the entire gravitational field, like not just the initial data. The actual um, uh, space-time metric will be preserved in some regions, you know. So um, so at some point, you know, at some point there'll be some change that comes in when when um, uh, you know, somewhere in the gluing region, something evolves and then interacts with your initial data later and then changes the space-time metric from what it was here sometime later. But once you've preserved the initial data on a small piece, you preserve some of the uh, uh, gra gravitational field in, in, in space-time. OK? So and it preserved it exactly, not, not even just close. Um, so, all right, so we want to address that question. How do you do, um, how would you try to do deformations? And what is the non degeneracy condition to allow deformations and um, uh, preserve the data on chosen regions? Um, now, to do that, um, we're going to use the linearization of the scalar curvature operator. For the full constraints, you study the linearization of the full constraint operator, but that's that's got more symbols and it's, there's got some more technical details. There, there are results for the full constraints. Now the point is, in the gluing constructions, you come up with an approximate configuration and then you go to deform it. So last time we were discussing using conformal deformations. And the conformal factor makes the metric, the, the initial data, change a little bit on these pieces. And you want something where you can glue things together and make sure whatever deformations you are going to produce, the deformations are supported in a given region, let's say, and the deformations don't leak out into the other two pieces. So you, need some, uh, you want some localized uh, deformations. So you want, to stay, you want to be able to move outside the conformal class uh, of your approximate solution. OK? So uh, again, for the scalar curvature constraint, uh, we've had this equation up a few times. Um, you want to study the full sort of scalar curvature map. Metric goes to R of G. Um, we've written up the linearization a couple of times. It involves a double divergence of a Laplacian and a Ricci term, a lower order term. We saw that come up the first day. Um, came up in a few of the talks. And you have the important operator, the L2 adjoint, L star, which I'll remind you is just defined by the equation integral of F L G and integrate by parts, Lg star f times h. OK? So when you integrate by parts, the Laplacian comes over, two divergences become a Hessian, and the Ricci term just kind of comes along for the ride. So this equation is important, and I'll write it up a couple times. Now, um, one thing I'll point out, again, the, the constraints we said are, 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 
form an elliptic system, I'll know um, the operator LL star is, you know, the principal part of it is the biharmonic. You, you, that's a good exercise, it's a simple exercise, so you can see that, that if you compose, you're going to get uh, Laplace operator squared, it's fourth order. All right, so a non-trivial element in the kernel of L star, that's going to give us our non-degeneracy condition, is called, uh, sometimes called a static potential, or, or static vacuum uh, potential. Um, and on note for use in this example, I wrote down L star again here, so if you take a trace, uh, if you trace the metric, you get, this is a Ramanian metric, or I guess it's, so the dimension's n. So you take the trace of the metric, you get n times Laplacian with the minus sign. If you trace the Hessian, you get another Laplacian. That gives you this first term. If you trace the Ricci, you have the scalar curvature. So the, the trace of L star is this. I'll make a comment on that uh, analytically uh, in a minute, but. Uh, so an example of spaces with that admit kernel of L star are some constant curvature spaces, for example. Um, if you look at the flat metric, the Euclidean metric, and want to solve L star equals zero, then you can look up here. If L star is zero, at the Euclidean metric, R is zero. So that means the Laplacian is zero. So if you go up to this equation, that means the Hessian is zero, which means the functions have to be linear or constant. Okay, so in n dimensions, you have an n plus 1 dimensional kernel. Turns out that's the maximum dimensional kernel you can have. Okay? So if you look at a flat torus, we've seen that come up before, uh, the flat torus locally, your only <laughs> solutions are going to be linears and constants. But they have to, they'd have to be periodic or something to descend to the torus. So on the flat torus, all you have is the constant function. You can also see that from the fact that the Laplace has to be zero and the torus is compact. Now the round sphere has non-zero curvature and it turns out the kernel of L star on the sphere is you take your ambient coordinate functions restricted to the sphere. Okay, and, and so those spaces are all uh, static. Or they have static potential. Okay. Um, a fact about static potentials in relation to space-time metrics, I'll just mention this to, to, to get a fact in, and then we'll do another example, is if n solves a non-trivial solves L star equals zero, if you make the space-time metric G bar using n as this uh, lapse function, minus n squared dt squared plus g, you can compute, I think it's on your homework set, if you haven't done the exercise, you can compute the Ricci curvature of G bar, this metric, and you get that it's, uh, the metric is Einstein, okay? And the coefficient is, is proportional to the scalar curvature of the Riemannian metric G, okay? Um, and so actually then you can prove, assuming you know, that your manifold's connected, that R of G is constant, okay? So if you have a connected space that has kernel of LG star, your scalar curvature is constant. So that means your metrics are already somewhat special. This is constant scalar curvature. Okay, one of our favorite metrics is, a sh or maybe our favorite, I don't know, it's up to you. But a short shell metric, which I write in three space dimensions as, I write it in this form, uh, the short shield spatial piece, which is this, um, plus the, the dt squared term, we've seen this before, which means if you compare it means that this function, this quotient here, is in the kernel of L star at the Schwarzschild metric. Okay. If you look at this G bar metric, you might worry about where the lapse function has zeros. It's something to be concerned about. Okay, but and, um, uh, it turns out in general, if it's if n is um, if this, if this kernel element's not trivial, the zero sets a nice uh, totally geodesic uh, hypersurface, and in this Schwarzschild case. This n equals zero is exactly that minimum sphere. If, 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 if m is positive, if positive mass, we've drawn this before, that the, uh, the short shield spatial metric looks like you know, large spheres coming into minimal sphere going back out, and the zero set is that horizon sphere. All right. So um, I'll mention this sort of the, the classical uh, theorem that uh, 
that um, is, uh, is proved on closed manifolds. There's asymptotic uh, versions as well. Um, uh, so um, L star is, a, is, a, is an operator from functions to sort of, you know, it's sort of to, well, to tensors, right? So it takes a scalar function to a tensor. So um, it's, someone asked yesterday about elliptic operators, for example. In this case, um, uh, it, the map L star is overdetermined elliptic. The constraints are underdetermined. We mentioned that a couple times. Um, the adjoint is overdetermined, elliptic in, in this case, um, which means the symbol is, is injective, if you, if you know what that means. But um, uh, in any case, uh, you don't expect this operator L star to have kernel. We just said already that um, if L star has kernel, then uh, the manifold has constant scalar curvature. But even amongst constant scalar curvature metrics, you can prove um, or that uh, you don't expect L star to have any kernel. So uh, you use elliptic PDE theory to prove that you know, on closed manifolds, okay, you can take an appropriate function space. Let's not get technical with that, but you know, Sabalev space of the, you know, or, or a holder space, for example. Elliptic regularity, maybe smooth spaces as well, smooth sections of, of tensors of functions. And prove that your function space splits as a direct sum of the image of LG, the linearization of scalar curvature, plus the kernel of L star. Okay, So um, if you're looking to prove a deformation result, Okay, deforming scalar curvature. For us, the idea is we're going to have some approximate solution to a scalar curvature equation, and we want, want to deform it in a prescribed way to solve the equation. So that means you want to have a good control over the linearized operator, and then maybe then by you know, inverse function theorem kind of ideas, linear corrections, you can then push the nonlinear operator in the direction you want to solve the equation. That's, that's the idea. That's calculus, right? So, um, so well, in infinite dimensions. Right? So, so the idea is you want to apply the inverse function theorem, okay, to say, and here's the non-degeneracy condition: if the kernel of L star is zero, so no non-trivial static potentials, that means that your linearization of your scalar curvature is onto, is surjective, okay. So, <coughs> then the implicit function theorem tells you that for for the nonlinear operator, that there's a small epsilon positive. So for functions s that are in small enough norm, that's going to measure whatever norm you're using. I'm not going to get technical. So um, that's going to measure sort of how large your deformation is. You can solve for a smooth h, okay? Suitably, the size of it controlled by s, so by epsilon. So that uh, R of G plus H is R of G plus the prescribed deformation. That's, that's just you know, implicit function theory. That's Fisher Marsden. So as a corollary, I'll mention a result um, uh, in, in uh, Lan Xuan's lecture. She mentioned about uh, deforming um, non-negative scalar curvature to positive scalar curvature. Um, she mentioned uh, a Kasdan Warner proof. There's also this proof by Fisher Marsden. Um, uh, so um, maybe, well, uh, uh. so uh, suppose you have a, a closed manifold connected, does not emit a manifold of positive scalar curvature. Okay, then any metric of non-negative scalar curvature must be Ricci flat. Okay, that, that's what. Uh, so uh, let, let's do the proof. Suppose the scalar curvature is non-negative, all right, but not you know, strictly positive. Um, by the previous theorem, right, the kernel must be non-zero. If the kernel were zero, you can prescribe a small bumping up of the curvature, make the, make the curvature go from whatever it is and add epsilon to it. Okay, so, so, so the kernel must be non-zero. So there must be a, a static potential f that goes into this equation makes it zero, OK? But in that case, the scalar curvature is constant. It's non-negative, but it can't be positive, so it must be zero, OK? Which means if you trace this equation like we did before, 
Laplacian zero on a closed manifold, F must be harmonic on a closed manifold, it must be constant. So if you now take that constant one and stick it in at your potential equation, derivatives are gone, the Ricci must be zero. It must be Ricci flat. Questions? Sorry, could you uh, remind me again why the scalar temperature is constant when you have a standard temperature? So one proof of it, and there's a couple of proofs, but I, so on the previous slide, I won't go back, is that um, we, if you use the, maybe I will, uh, two slides. Um, if you use the solution of the equation to make a space-time metric, then that space-time metric is Einstein, right? So we're in dimensions three and higher yeah. than this scalar curvature then in front of you must be constant. That, that, so if you, you have an Einstein metric in high enough dimension, then that must be constant. That, that, that's one, one, one way to prove it. OK. So the um, analog of the fischer marsden theorem that, that gets us in the direction we want to go is a, uh, a localized um, deformation. And again, th there are various versions of it uh, with different kind of levels of, of technicality. But the simplest way to state it is maybe this one. And you want to think about it as um, you have some nice smooth domain. OK? And then um, we're going to look at the operator L star on that domain. And suppose it has trivial kernel on the domain. OK? What we're going to do is we're going to, for the, for the sake of stating it this way, we're going to pull in the domain a little bit into a compactly supported subdomain. Okay. Once you give me that, all right, um, then there's an epsilon not positive, depending on the on the domain, subdomain. Um, and now it looks kind of like the previous result. If you take a, a compactly supported function inside that subdomain that was chosen. Uh, this constant epsilon naught will depend on how close the two domains are. Right? Um, let me not get into that. Uh, supposing S is small enough, then you can solve for a metric supported inside omega bar with the scalar curvature of the de deformation to be the scalar curvature plus S. OK, so that's the localized version. Um, if you have S supported, so support of S is in omega naught, then the support of H might be able to leak out toward the boundary of omega, but that's where it'll be contained. And what I mean is, if there's stuff outside that's smooth, H, the tensor, will extend outside of omega, if, if there is an outside of omega, smoothly. You can do this at various degrees of regularity. You can also do this with the you know, smooth category. So I want to make a remark on the, the non-degeneracy condition, because, again, you need it. It's not just the, um, in general, you need it. So um, for example, um, all right. So suppose you thought about trying to do this on a domain in, in, in Euclidean space, right? As we learned um, from you know, the, the talks of, uh, well, the talk yesterday, for example, of Mikhail, um, the, related to the positive mass theorem, there are no metrics of non-negative scalar curvature on, you know, on Rn, on R3 or on Rn, uh, which outside a compact set is exactly flat. And then you can roll it up into a torus. Okay, so so this means that you know, this localized deformation definitely can't work at the flat metric. You, you can't bump the scalar curvature up a little tiny bit in a compact way at, at the flat metric. It, you just can't. So. OK, keep that in mind. OK, so I'll say a couple ingredients of the proof, but then I want to get on to um, uh, some, some applications of it. But, but um, what is the mechanism of the proof? The mechanism of the proof is to make the inverse function theorem work um, in a setting where, because of the way you have to set up the function spaces for the problem and you're not solving a boundary value problem exactly. You want the derivatives to vanish at all orders. So it doesn't feel like it's going to work. Um, there isn't a functional theoretical 
setting in which you just kind of hit it with the inverse function theorem. You sort of do the inverse function theorem by hand um, in, in a way that I'll, I'll sort of say uh, in, in a moment or two. So, um, all right. So, um, I'll recall, I think, I don't know if this is written up or not before, but um, you have an L2 Sobolev norm. If you have an HK norm, that's the squared is this, for example, the sum of the squares of the derivative norms and an L2 norm up to K. All right. That's a Sobolev norm. Um, I think Lon defined uh, Holder norm, even weighted Holder norms in, 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 in her lecture. Um, so the, the key to obtaining, um, the, or the key to getting this process started is getting a good estimate, a PDE estimate on L star. Okay, and for the scalar curvature operator, it's very easy. For the full constraint operator, which I'll spare the, the, the details, uh, you have to work a little hard, okay, to get uh, associated estimates, but you can still do it. So the idea is that um, um, if you have this operator L star, then on, on a domain omega, you can get this elliptic kind of estimate. Estimate u and its first two derivatives by its lower derivatives and L star in L2. That's, a, that's an elliptic estimate. And there's no boundary terms. There's no boundary terms here. So if you know PDEs, you'd expect there to be a boundary term. And there isn't. OK? So the idea of the proof is very simple. Here's L star. When you estimate h2, well, you have h1 on this side. So all you have to put on this side is the Hessian. Well, the Hessian right here is already included in L star. Well, so is the Laplacian. Yeah? But the Laplacian, if you take the trace of L star, the Laplacian is controlled by the trace of L star up to lower order terms u. Those lower order terms can go into h1 norm. OK? So it's, it's very simple. You just do pointwise and, and integrate to solve, to get that estimate. Okay, so it's a very simple. Um, what you want to use, and that's no condition on anything, what you want to use now is that if L star has no kernel, then, and if you're familiar with elliptic theory, you kind of know what's coming, you want to get rid of this lower order term on the right hand side, okay? And that can be done, that's the next slide, okay? If you have trivial kernel in H2, then you can prove an estimate H2 norm is less than or equal to a constant times L star in L2, and no lower order terms. And that can be proved uniformly. Um, so here's omega. You can, oops, you can look at, you can prove an estimate like that on omega or on, on um, any compactly supported subdomain, like you know, the distance. Um, uh, uh, sort of look at the level sets of the distance function and, and look at the interior of that domain and prove the estimate on those omega epsilons. And you can get a uniform estimate on, on all of those. And so then, and maybe here's the only slide where I'll tell you about the, a little bit of the function theory that you need to make sure when you solve this problem in the end that your solution, what's your solution, by the way? OK, you start with a metric. And you're going to solve for a metric deformation. You're going to solve for a tensor h to make the scalar curvature move a little bit. You want that tensor to go to 0 at the boundary and extend smoothly. You have to make it do that. It doesn't want to on its own, right? So to make it do that, you solve in spaces that are going to make it happen. You're going to use a weight function rho which, if you parse this, there's a minus and a 1 over d. So uh, e to the minus 1 over d near the boundary of omega, right, right, does what? Near the, d is distance to the boundary. So near the boundary goes to 0 exponentially fast in, in, as you approach the boundary. So you're going to use um, this weight function. All right, it's going to appear in the various estimates that, and, and function spaces you use here to force decay somehow. Now, the only way you can do you can write whatever you want. I'm being drawn over pictures, but you have to make sure you get the right estimates to make the theory work. Um, 
and without doing any, any details, if you define the weighted Sobolev norms, there's weighted Holder norms that I'll spare you, uh, in this way, take the derivatives at different orders, and there's different ways to define this space, and the weight comes in in the volume measure you use to do the L2 integral of the derivatives. Again, there's different ways to do this. But this preceding estimate, which is true on all sort of against domains bounded by all these small uh, distance level sets, can be integrated to give you this coercivity estimate in the weighted space. Okay, so that's the kind of estimate that makes this roll. Now, if you followed that, great. If you didn't, you still look and say, there's some injectivity estimate. That's what you want to take away, that u is bounded by L star u when there's no kernel. OK? No boundary terms needed. What do you use an injectivity estimate like this for? You use it to solve a linearized problem. OK? So we're trying to solve a nonlinear scalar curvature problem. We'll start by solving the linearized problem. Instead of solving r of g you know, plus whatever equals the scalar curvature we want, instead, let's just try to like, move the scalar curvature at a linear level in any direction we want. OK? Don't worry about the spaces. Okay. So we try to solve this. And we can solve this in a way that the solution is rho L star u. That's the tensor that goes in here. So I said on the first slide, or, well, I don't know, the third slide, that the relevant operator is kind of L L star, kind of twisted by a weight. Uh, and you can see L here, and the H is an L star. So it's a fourth order operator on u. OK? So the point is, you can solve the linear problem with tensors of this form. The row that's here is that weight we said before is a weight that decays at the boundary. And that's going to force the decay of H near the boundary. All right? So at this point, I'll just sort of you know, uh, do what I've been doing and wave the laser. But the point is, OK, you want to solve this equation. It's a linear equation. It's nice if you can solve it variationally. And the point is, this functional, kind of like you can compare this to solving you know, a Poisson equation or something when you have Laplace U equals f and you have an integral of grad squared. It's kind of what we're doing here. You build this functional in the right spaces. 1 half L star squared. The weight is here. The, lower, the right hand side against u is here. You have this functional, and then you show it has a minimum. OK? You need the injectivity estimate. Bear with me for a minute. You have this lower order bound on L. So L star from below is u, bounded by u. That means here, L star squared, this integral, is bounded from below. So your functional has a sort of a convex property to it. And that allows you to get a minimizer. And the Euler-Lagrange equation is exactly the linear equation. That's the, that's the setup. Um, one thing that's important is when you do this, um, your solution, is not only you can show it decays nicely at the boundary, but u, and hence h, will be small if sigma is small. So if you're here, it's a linear problem. So if, you, if L is surjective on the right spaces, you can, sigma can be anything. But now, uh, if we're going to solve the nonlinear problem, we're gonna, the convergence will be that the iteration will converge if your deformation is small. And you can see that here. If your deformation is small, your solution is going to be small. And then you can iterate. Question? Yeah, good. All right, I was trying to put that. Um, so when you do the estimate that I, I threw a slide away, because you know time flies when you're having fun. So, so um, essentially, uh, you're going to put it in by hand in between these two things. So if you notice, sigma belongs to a space with a row inverse that I tried to slip by it. And then u belongs to a space with a row. So actually, you're going to squeeze a row and a row inverse in between here, or square root of those. And it's kind of there. It's kind of built in. I, I could have teased it out exactly, but yeah, it's kind of built in, into the spaces where these things live already. Yeah. All right, so we can solve the linear problem with good estimates. So uh, we're going to solve the nonlinear problem through, um, you know, through the process of iterated linear corrections. 
Now again, you, you want to say, well, that's just a proof of the inverse function theorem, so why don't you just state the inverse function theorem? Because we don't have a setup, and I'd love to see a good, people try to like, make a good setup for this that just fits into an inverse function theorem setting and just state it, and I don't know, I mean, there's... But anyway, you can prove it by hand just by doing iterated linear corrections and showing the iteration convergence. So the idea is we want to solve this PDE, R of G plus H equals the original plus a small deformation. Okay? So you rewrite the difference in terms of a Taylor expansion. The linearized problem, LGH, we can solve it equal to S. So we've solved our problem up to quadratic error. Okay? Now, one thing I'll mention here, if you know a little elliptic theory, is so we're going to solve this in some finite regularity space, some C C2, CK, C4, whatever. And the solution will start out by being in that space. And then if all your data is smooth, your manifold's smooth, your, or your, I mean, your metric's smooth, then you'll be able to use elliptic theory to prove that your solution is actually smooth to all orders. Okay, so... So that gives you the local, localized deformation of uh, scalar curvature. There's also a localized deformation of the constraints operator with similar kind of non-degeneracy condition. OK, so I'll make a quick um, comment before going on to a different kind of gluing construction. Um, we spent some time talking about doing constant scalar curvature constraint gluing using the conformal method. OK? And um, it was a question that I was thinking about um, was, again, how to take two solutions and glue them together like this and preserve the metric or preserve the data outside the gluing region. Um, so I first tried to attack the problem without using conformal method. Like, well, a conformal method is not going to help. Um, uh, and it does help because, as, as observed by... Uh, crucial and delay. Um, if you use the uh, IM, uh, use the IMP or the, the constant scalar curvature kind of conformal gluing method, it produces a family of solutions of the scalar curvature equation, which outside a you know outside the gluing region is at least close to the original configuration. So the conformal gluing has a non-degeneracy condition in it. So you, suppose you have the um, if you're going to do a localized gluing, you also need a condition on the kernel of L star. So if you assume that each piece satisfies that non-degeneracy condition too, then you actually can use the conformal method to produce some solutions of a constant scalar curvature equation where the data is close to the original data, and then once it's close enough, eh, there's some details, but once the data is close enough, the data on each piece will be close to the original data. You can show by the estimates or whatever that the kernel will still be trivial at that data. And then you can go in in some region where, so you have, suppose on this piece you have your approximate solution we said yesterday, whatever. Well, actually, your solution is gamma t. And it's approximately equal to the original G1 here. Right? And what you can do is, if your kernel of L star is non-trivial here, let's say, right? you can go in here and so uh, green doesn't look. So if this is now gamma t was your solution you got by gluing in the conformal method, and g1 is your original metric, then you glue g1 back in, and you patch it into the gamma t in this region. At that point, you haven't solved, you haven't solved the scalar curvature equation. You have an approximate solution. Each one on their own, gamma t solves the constant scalar curvature equation, g1 solves the equation, and the metrics are close away from the neck. So you glue them together here, 
putting the original metric back where it was. Now, in that strip, you have approximate constant scalar curvature, what you want. But at this point, you also have the kernel is trivial, so you can use the localized deformation to push the scalar curvature back where it belongs. Okay. All right. So um, as I said on the first lecture, in the last 37 seconds, we'll get to the, the end. And I have 17 minutes, so that's better than, I'm doing better than, that's because I pulled out some slides. And, and you've been polite and haven't asked me too many questions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, any questions before we go on to the last part? OK. Um, so the last part in your uh, idea or explanation was that you're pushing the original metric G1 by the linear deformation. So here, well, uh, 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 where are you asking? So um, yeah, so, so what you have is um, uh, you've got two metrics. You've got, in the end, I'm going to draw it this way. In the neck and beyond is your gamma t you solve for by conformal methods. Um, maybe I'll draw it this way. Then out here. I'm going to put G1 back on the original piece. And so that means that you know, in some strip, I've patched them together. Yeah. But now, there, so the scalar curvature is constant here. It's what it's supposed to be here. All you've done is messed up a little bit in the strip. If you've got this localized deformation available in the strip, you can now use well, the non, you know, iterated linear corrections that solve a nonlinear problem to deform it, but only in the strip. The scalar, everywhere else was already good. And if you only deform it in the strip, then you've left G1 alone out here, which is what you wanted. OK. So um, the last sort of suite of questions we'll consider um, sort of introduced by saying, again, reminding you, we, I said this earlier, and you've heard this before. The, the only, um, uh, oh, I said asymptotically flat metric. I don't have to say it well. I mean, so the only metric which is uh, non negative scalar curvature um, and is flat in a neighborhood of infinity, right, is just flat, OK? Um, so you could then say, people did ask, uh, what if you replace the neighborhood of infinity uh, not by the flat metric, but by our next favorite metric, which is the Schwarzschild metric? Could you have a metric, let's say, on R3, which has non-negative scalar curvature right, and is Schwarzschild near infinity? Okay. Now, Schwarzschild isn't defined on R3. right? Even if it has positive mass, it's defined on punctured R3. Okay. Um, so the question is, could you have a neighborhood of infinity be exactly Schwarzschild? Now, the point is, in terms of the evolution problem, um, you know, infinity, let's say, is out here. Okay. So if your favorite metric is Schwarzschild and you have a neighborhood of infinity that's Schwarzschild, that means when you evolve the problem, you have a neighborhood of infinity, future null infinity, whatever, that's actually just exactly Schwarzschild as well. Eventually, some, you know, some of the other data inside here will radiate out and you'll stop being Schwarzschild exactly. Okay. So um, the answer to the question depends on how you ask. Well, actually, the answer is yes in either case. But uh, the proof is different depending on how you ask it. Um, if you look for non-negative scalar curvature metrics, I'll remark that Hugh Bray showed that you can have <coughs> metrics on R3 that are Schwarzschild exactly, exactly Schwarzschild near infinity outside a compact set. Uh, you have to allow some positive scalar curvature. Uh, the proof is similar to a proof that Lon gave um, bending metrics around. Um, um, you have to allow some positive scalar curvature to be able to do that, right? to be able to do Hughes' proof. And the question is, well, what if you want to remove any positive scalar curvature and solve the vacuum constraint and still have a neighbor of infinity be Schwarzschild? OK? So the answer is yes, you can do that. And these gluing methods uh, allow us to do that. All right. Let's see how. OK? So um, 
you might you could think 3D. I, I wrote it in n dimensions just because uh, I'm you know I don't know anyway just because I did. Um, so you take a short shell metric of mass m and center c. So we usually write it where it's centered at zero, but you can recenter that. You can put the puncture wherever you want. Um, so then uh, one theorem is the following. Uh, let E be an asymptotic end, so just, just the exterior of a ball. So it's not complete space, just the exterior of a ball, just one end. And take an asymptotically flat metric with zero scalar curvature and non-zero mass. So we've seen the mass come up. Take non-zero mass. So you mean, don't, you don't mean positive? No, I don't mean positive. This, I mean, this could be negative at this point. It's not a complete metric. But anyway, just non-zero. Then there's some parameter value large. So that for theta bigger than that large parameter value, there's a metric, g theta. R g theta is 0, so you've solved the vacuum constraint. The metric is the original metric for a, kind of as, as a big of a compact set as you want. So a large radius value. You can preserve the original metric. And then outside a radius, say twice theta, the metric is exactly short shield. So in other words, if you're thinking of an asymptotically flat end, what you've done is you take g naught up to theta. Theta to 2 theta is the gluing region. And outside, you put an appropriate short shield. OK? So you preserve. A large part of the, as much as you want. If you've got a, your favorite uh, uh, geometry at scalar curvature zero somehow, and inside a ball of radius 17, you want to have that metric and leave it alone, you can do that. Uh, and you then have to glue it in some annular region. And then outside, you can have it be short. Okay. Now, the key is, and you know, we'll see how far the proof we have. We still have 10 minutes. The, the key is, um, there is a spatial short shield metric that agrees. This doesn't say you can put any short shield metric you want there. OK? In fact, you can't do, you have to pay the price a little bit. So there is a short shield metric. Uh, which one remains to be seen? OK? Um, questions on the statement? Uh, you'll see in the argument, it's just, uh, yeah, you, you, you'll see it, you'll see it. So th there are certain cases um, where you could have mass zero, because it's, it's not a complete metric, so you could have. So if you write down a situation where, for example, I, I'll give you an example where you could have zero mass. I forget if I put it on the slide um, coming up, but we might not even get there. So, so uh, if the metric, let's say, were parity symmetric, so the center of mass was zero, period, and it's symmetric exactly, I think zero mass, I mean, zero mass would be fine in, in that case to glue. Uh, but, but then you're not, you're not running into, it, it's on an exterior end, so you're not running into positive mass theorem. And it turns out in that case, if you've got exact parity symmetry, uh, the center of mass will just be zero. And it never comes in, and then you only need to vary the mass. Um, now, the, the overall mass of the thing you get, the Schwartz you get in that case, if you start with something with zero mass, uh, but it's not flat, uh, on an end or something like that, you can write down such a metric using conformal factor. The, the m you get here, I'm not sure what the sign is going to be. It'll be some small number. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah. So this is, the way I stated it is that you want to think about it. The deformation is exactly going to be local, localized in the end. So if, for example, this happens to be a complete asymptotically flat metric and you're just looking at the end, fine, you can still do this. It's local to the end. It's not global, right? It's not global. So it doesn't matter what's happening in, inside here. It doesn't see that. As a conformal deformation, we kind of see everything, even, even a, 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 a little bit. All right, so how does this work? All right. Um, okay, I said all that. So again, the, um, 
uh, someone was asking yesterday again about the, the asymptotically flat. Um, we assume we're going to work in coordinates on the end where the metric and the delta ij, zeros and ones, differ by some order. The star just means every time you take a derivative out there at the end, you get one order better of decay. Um, you could think for the purpose of the last seven minutes here, um, n is 3 and q is 1, kind of standard Schwarzschild kind of decay. So that would mean the metric is flat plus 1 over distance. The first derivative is 1 over distance squared, and so on. I'm, at this point, I'm too tired to count how many of these I need, probably two or three derivatives. But OK, let's not worry. OK, so here's the proof, more or less. Um, first thing we're going to do is um, take the problem and scale it down to unit size annulus. Why? Well, um, I want to essentially apply the localized deformation theorem on a fixed region. So I'm, I make it be a unit annulus from radius 1 to 2. That way, because the constants in your estimates depend on your region. So let's fix the region. Yeah? So to do that, we have uh, you know, the scaling transformation, f theta, which just takes x to theta x. So pull the metric back to the unit annulus. When you do that, the metric components aren't like delta ij. So you rescale them by dividing by the large theta squared, and that makes your metric actually close to the flat metric. You think about what happens when, 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 when you pull back. So when you pull back, so moving a little bit in the unit annulus, moving unit size in the unit annulus corresponds to moving theta size on the bigger annulus. So you have to rescale. All right? At this point, your pullback metric is close to Euclidean on the unit annulus. What happens to you, think about this, is that every time you take a derivative of this g theta, you say, oh, I'm going to fall off faster. I'll be closer to Euclidean. No, because remember, in the unit annulus, taking a derivative is like taking theta times a derivative on the bigger annulus. So you gain one decay because derivatives gain decay, but you lose one because you're taking a faster derivative somehow. So they cancel out, and it's OK. That still means that this metric and the flat metric are close as long as state is large. You're just not getting better decay with every derivative. OK, so now we're on the unit annulus. And so you now just do a convex combination of your pullback metric. This is your original metric rescaled and a short shield metric of mass m over theta, OK, so, and then a c. Now let's talk for a second. m over theta. m is close to the original mass of the original metric. So it's just some, some number that's non-zero. So that's m. And then we divide by theta. That means the mass is small. You're on a fixed coordinate chart. So if you have your Schwarzschild metric, and you write it on a fixed coordinate chart, and the mass is small, your metric's close to what? Small mass. Close to? Flat. You might say, wait a second. Schwarzschild metric of small mass has really high curvature near the horizon, because you're pinching it in to a small sphere. OK, great. But you're doing this in an, in an end over here. And the, the more you pinch the Schwarzschild metric, the flatter it gets in a fixed coordinate annulus. Okay? That's how these things fit together the right way. Okay? The center of mass is just, at this point, just bounded so that we're not seeing the puncture of the short shield. We're not seeing that. That's inside the, the annulus less than one, and we, we're, not, we're not gluing there. So we don't have to worry about that. All right? She so said, great. That's great. Now we have, on a unit annulus, we have a sum of two terms. They're both close to flat. We want to solve the scalar curvature equation the scalar curvature is close to zero. Just apply the localized deformation to deform compactly supported in the annulus to make the scalar curvature zero. We got three and a half minutes. Let's go get coffee. No, it doesn't work that way yet. Why? Well, because remember, the flat metric has kernel of L star. We did that earlier. That was our first example. 
L star of 1, 0 at the flat metric. L star of x, y, z, 0 at the flat metric. So you might say, well, luckily, we're not at the flat metric. We're only near the flat metric, so we're probably still in good shape. Well, the problem is um, we're not in good shape. Um, oh, I even wrote it here so I can, I can save some chalk. So we need an estimate like this, uniform estimate like that, uniform in our theta. You don't have that. You see, on the, on the left-hand side, that's fixed. As theta gets larger, these things get closer to zero. So you don't have a uniform estimate. So your solution would break down. Um, however, uh, if you estimate in a space that, so this kernel is finite dimensional. So it's some um, finite dimensional piece. If you kept your functions in a transverse space to that piece, uh, you could prove this estimate. OK? And that's the game. Um, so um, what you do is, instead of being too greedy and solving the problem all at once, you first solve a projected localized deformation problem. OK? Instead of solving r of g equals 0, what you do is, so if this, board, if this table is the finite dimensional bad space, what you do is look in the good space where you can move the scalar curvature kind of as you wish and make the scalar curvature be 0 in these infinitely many directions through PDE theory. You just do that. That leaves your scalar curvature living in a finite dimensional space, which we'll handle in the last 37 seconds, as I said. Okay, but, but so um, if you want to take something away, a very simple kind of idea, if you have a self-adjoint operator just on Rn, if you have kernel k and a subspace transverse to that kernel, right? then if you look at the projected problem, that's an isomorphism. Just, just count dimensions there. So that's the idea here. Um, the corresponding self-adjoint operator is, roughly speaking, LL star for some metric. And the kernel you're kind of avoiding, your approximate kernel, is this n plus 1 dimensional kernel. All right? So the idea is, at the linear level, it'll work like in linear theory. And then at the nonlinear level, you have to solve the projected nonlinear localized deformation problem with the, with the iterations, but always working orthogonal to the kernel. But as always, in the last 37 seconds, you have to pay for it, right? So the point is, you still want to solve scalar curvature equals 0. At this point, all you have is scalar curvature is basically some combination of these basis vectors. The scalar curvature is small, but it lives in this roughly this finite dimensional space. So you have to like measure what is it in that finite dimensional space. Okay? So to do that, you just take that scalar curvature that you have, that you've solved. You say, we've done enough work for one day. We've solved in infinitely many dimensions. It's equal to 0. You say, what is it in these finitely many dimensions? Well, let's multiply by the basis vectors one by one and integrate and see if we can tease out the, the the uh, expansion. All right? So you take your scalar curvature that's in these directions. You multiply the curvature by, oh, see, that's a typo. All right. You, you multiply the r by 1, the constant. You multiply r by x, the linear function, and you integrate. That's not supposed to, the big's not supposed to be there. The theta is, that's a scale factor. And you multiply this out, and you get a vector. And that vector is, um, this delta doesn't need to be here either, but the vector is the change in the mass. That means the mass of the Schwarzschild metric minus the mass of the inside, the original one. Okay? And then this is supposed to be m times c. You, you, you don't even need de delta there. So up to error terms. So the punchline is, and now you see that m times c term. Uh, you want that m to be not close to 0. Otherwise, it kind of uh, makes this mc term smaller than it should be. You want it to be definitely, so you want it to be a non-zero degree map. OK? If this is a good leading term, you can then pick the m on the outside Schwarzschild. You haven't picked the Schwarzschild yet. Pick the m and pick the c to make sure you can cover any error terms. 
and make the right-hand side be zero. That'll mean that your scalar curvature is zero and you've solved the problem. It's been fun. I'm now done. If you have questions, let me know. If not, you can always uh, ask me anytime you want. Thank you. <laughs>